Welcome once again to Captain Fred's Aviation Theater. Today we're visiting with Gary Graman and his Mooney Might. Uh, Gary, this is a very unique airplane, but uh, something happened the day before yesterday that you need to tell our viewers about. This uh, airplane celebrated its 50th birthday. It was built in September the 12th, certificated in September the 12th, 1949. So, a uh, day before yesterday, yes, this airplane had its 50th birthday. And uh, you've owned this airplane, and you've flown uh, Mooney Mites for 50 years yourself. Well, just about. I've owned it uh, since May of 1950, and I first flew it in uh, November of 1949. I rented it. There, there's not many people that have had an airplane that long. Uh, let, let's tell our viewers a little bit about the history of this airplane. Now, first of all, when people see this plane, most of them think that it's a home-built kit until they look at the tail, and then they see that distinctive Mooney tail, and uh, this was originally the first Mooney airplane. This launched the company. That's right. That's right. So they built it uh, with the Crosley. Uh, originally, and uh, now that's the Crosley engine Crosley from the little midget car. That's right, mm -hmm. Crosley engine, and uh, uh, to keep the price down, and uh, it was not successful. It broke crankshafts. What? Well, Twenty-five horsepower, <laughs> of course. It's kind of like the uh, the uh, Peaton Pole Air Camper. Mm -hmm. Originally, it was supposed to be powered by a Model T engine and uh, it wasn't enough, so they went to a Model A engine. So the Crosley was only 25 horse, and it was a disaster. It was a disaster. And it uh, just about broke the company, too. Is that right? Yeah. And so they finally, when they broke the crankshafts and they found Crosley was uh, making the changes, uh, that Mooney or the CAA didn't know about, undocumented, Al Mooney said, uh, forget it, and he went to the light company. Okay, let's, let's start with Al Mooney. Al Mooney worked for uh, Culver uh, Aviation. They made the Culver Cadet and the Culver Dart. Then Culver was acquired by Beach, and uh, th that's about the time that Mooney came up with the idea for his pocket rocket or his personal rocket which came to be the mite. Mm -hmm. uh, let's start at the beginning, at the very front here. Uh, originally, it had a wooden uh, Sensic uh, propeller. Sensenic. Sensenic propeller. And uh, Al Mooney recommended a change. What was that? Well, when he was at Gillespie Field visiting uh, Southern Cal Air Motor, which was a distributor, uh, I got to talk to him. And uh, I asked him which of the propellers was the best. And he said the Flotorp, which had just came out. And uh, so I ended up now with a You changed it to the Flotorp. Well, I didn't change it at that. I don't remember if I had the Flotorp or if I had a Sensenic at that time. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, I, I've been running Flotorps for many, many years. Moving back then, this one, when, when they got rid of the Crosley engine, they went to a Lycoming. Now, uh, you have a Lycoming in here because it has L's painted on the side of it. Uh, is it a 65 horse? Well, it was a 65, and uh, I constantly was uh, redlining it at uh, about one-third throttle, and uh, uh, it, it, that's another story because uh, it, it was, it's a little more streamlined than the stock uh, units. I 201-ized it. Yes. You and made a lot of modifications yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there, there's a uh, there's a 75 horsepower engine and uh, I uh, on a 337 which is aviation talk for permission from the mm -hmm. FAA I upgraded it to uh, 75 horsepower. The, the uh, it goes a little faster. It goes to 3,100 revolutions per minute uh, from 2550, and so I can I can get 
more capability out of the airplane, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a fast airplane. We have a twin engine coming in behind us. Uh, and uh, so how, how did you upgrade it? Was a carburetor change or what? It was. Uh, you have a problem with floating valves, and uh, you stiffen it with twin or two concentric valve springs instead of the single valve springs that they have for the 65. And so it's just a matter of changing the valve springs and uh, home free. Now originally this airplane was non-electric and you had to hand prop it and the, the most common method was from behind flipping it from in back. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you've added electricity uh, with an invention of your own. Would you tell our viewers about what you did? Well, I, uh, I put in an alternator. It had an electrical system. An automobile alternator. Yeah, well, it had an electrical system, which was a kit from the uh, factory, the Mooney factory. And I installed that, and it had a bump, bump here where the generator was. And uh, so I got rid of that and put the alternator back here between the magnetos. And uh, I ran a shaft up on the same general pulley and uh, it uh, puts out 35 amps. The reason I had to take the generator out is... Mine puts out 15. <laughs> <laughs> because I eight, eight amps, I couldn't fly at night. It was, uh, this was the age of electronics, as you mm -hmm. know. And, uh, well, uh, I, we need to mention that uh, you have made this an IFR airplane. Uh, and so you need a lot of power for all those instruments. Yeah, exactly. I have. I have the IFR uh, horizon and uh, uh, directional gyro, and uh, that takes it. And, and a strobe is uh, kind of mandatory, and a transponder is mandatory. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. all of this on an airplane that was originally non-electrical. That was it. Flying was simple in 50 years ago. Yes. And from cow pastures, and well, Gillespie Field was a surplus field at that time, and uh, it was. Uh, very unimproved. It had strips, uh, and I flew it out of Gillespie Field. I remember when radios first came in. I carried. Uh, I had a Genave 10. It was a little radio with 10 crystals in it, and I had a motorcycle battery taped to it and a coat hanger for a handle. And I would carry it in and out of. Uh, I had a 1946 Aronka Chief, and that that was my electronics. I would carry that in and out. Um, also, now, this airplane was a way ahead of its time in many ways. It has uh, retractable landing gear. Yes, it was. Would you tell our viewers about that? Well, it was retra it's retractable landing gear, and it's a tricycle gear, and it's a steerable nose wheel, and uh, tow brakes. The uh, gear actuates with a, uh, with a lever, and uh, you grab it, pull it down, and you just push it up when the gear is up. Now, since this airplane was non-electrical, uh, the retractable system has to be manual. It's not hydraulic or electrical, it, it's manual. That's so uh, your muscles retract the gear. And uh, it had a uh, wig wag. There was a uh, windshield mo wiper motor. And... Uh, now that ran off of your manifold? It ran off of the manifold uh, pressure. Just like windshield wipers? Yes, mm -hmm. and then there's a switch on the uh, throttle, and upon actuation of the switch, it would start start uh, wig ragging back and forth. It had a little red ball on it, mm -hmm. a little disc. And, and uh, that was if the throttle went below 1,200 or something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In spite of that, uh, it was bellied in five times by other renters. <laughs> well, you know, everybody has to go through that once. You know, it's kind of like your your first dance and your first kiss. Uh, it, it has to happen to you sometime. There's a very interesting uh, story about that wigwag signal that we want to talk about right after we come back from this very important message. We'll be right back. This week's 10 liter may have grown up in a man's world, but she never let that keep her from reaching her dream of becoming a pilot. And now that she has her wings, she wants to make sure there are plenty of other women in the clouds. Leonard Villarreal has more on how our leader is encouraging young girls.
Ana Cambreros province is sharing a passion, sharing a dream come true. So how do you like it? It's fun, isn't it? Yeah. Are you ready to be a pilot? Yeah. Good. Her goal is to use the power of flight to help girls build self-esteem and confidence. Since I learned to fly, I thought it would be nice to give back to the community and especially to encourage young girls to become pilots. Ana is using her passion for airplanes to make sure girls know they don't have to leave flying to men. Men are still dominating this field. And um, sometimes it's difficult for little girls to understand that they can become a pilot too. Ana does this by helping Girl Scouts earn the elusive aerospace badge. Ana enlisted a team of female pilots to create the aerospace badge seminar for San Diego County Girl Scouts. You have different instruments here. You will know to identify them. Using a hangar for a classroom, Ana and her team of female pilots offer a 16-hour course on aviation. Other lessons are given right on the tarmac. Before, the prop is what pulls everything. The entire airplane is being pulled by this piece of metal here. The seminar is so popular, there are 180 local Girl Scouts on a waiting list. One of the things you need to check when you are going to fly is the kind of gasoline you are using. For Girl Scout leaders, the seminar is more than an educational experience. It's a barrier buster. They learn diversity, and mostly because they see that there are women that do things that they might not see most of the time. And clearly, Anna's seminar opens a new area of interest. Ask girls what they want to be. Probably be a pilot. Jump behind one of those planes and just take off? <laughs> yeah. Would that be fun? Yeah. Clear prop! Insurance issues won't allow Anna to take the girls up, but a few get to feel the power of the aircraft. So once we landed and we are ready to put it in the hangar, we have to turn everything on. There's no telling how many of these girls will actually learn to fly, but this is an experience that will last. And then you like had to turn it back, and then you had to turn it again, and then you had to turn it back. Anna, you're helping girls learn the importance of aviation, and for that we present you with the Channel 10 Leadership Award. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Ana Camperado's province fulfilled one dream by learning to fly. Her new dream is to make sure every girl knows they can choose to do the same. I want them all to be flying. With leadership photographer Bruce Andrus, I'm Leonard Villarreal, 10 News. Great story. Great, great. Welcome back to Captain Fred's Aviation Theater. Gary, the anecdote that I uh, made reference to was that uh, to keep people from going in gear up, they install this red ball wigwag system. And uh, people still went in gear up, but their excuse was that they were distracted by the red ball <laughs> waving and they forgot to put the gear up. <laughs> That's about right. Now you've replaced that red ball with something else. It's uh, the light system and uh, and uh, a wobbling siren that goes directly to my earphones. So you've got a red light flashing mm -hmm. and, and a siren uh, going off too. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the uh, specifications of this airplane. Uh, it's very light, something like 500 pounds? 520 pounds uh, stripped the way it came out of the factory, 521 pounds. Uh, that's almost an ultralight. Yeah, yeah. An ultralight, I think, is 380. So uh, it's very close to being an ultralight. And it's uh, six feet, two inches tall at, at the height of the tail. Yeah. And uh, that was John Wayne's height, incidentally. He was six feet two. And uh, I believe it's a 25 foot wingspan. 26 feet, 10 inches. 26 feet, 10 inches. Um, it's metal tubing covered with fabric. Back, back to behind the cockpit, mm -hmm. uh, metal tube covered with uh, sheet uh, aluminum and the fuselage from uh, here on back is uh, a wood monocoque which means uh, after a frame it's uh, 1 16th inch It's like wood. veneer. Plywood, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the wing is all wood also. Uh, the wing is wood with a plywood leading edge? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you have a combination of metal tubing wood and fabric all yes. three and then uh, the control surfaces are uh, steel tube and fabric 
So you've got everything incorporated in here except composite, which they didn't have at that time. No. <clears throat> well, it might be said this is the original composite airplane. Well, because it contained all of those yes. three elements. Uh -huh. uh, let's talk about the Mooney tail. Do you know why Al Mooney designed this distinctive tail? There, there were aerodynamic reasons. Uh, uh, for instance, in a near stall, you have a lot more control uh, over your rudder with this tail because it faces into the wind. Whereas uh, the, the tails that were around here now that everybody's using with the uh, swept back tail, uh, they weren't designed at that particular time. But uh, as an afterthought, they are less efficient in a stall position, stall condition. Now, they designed something, I don't remember the correct name, the very easy fly or something. You can trim your rudder and trim your uh, elevator and trim everything, and it all moves at once. You turn one knob. Uh, do you have that on this airplane? I have that on my airplane. It's called Simply Fly. Simply Fly. Simply Fly. Uh, the, trim, the trim crank uh, will trim the tail, the movable tail that all goes up and down. And uh, it uh, goes back to a certain part, and then it brings the flaps down, and then continues its movement on the tail. And so, so it's very easy to to fly uh, in a trim or landing. Well, mode. once you trim that up, you can you can just sit there and fly. Simply fly. Yeah. Well, I I've flown for uh, quite a few uh, miles. Uh, with my feet off the rudder pedals and my hands folded. And uh, Now in most airplanes, you, you have a trim and you trim the elevator so that you're not having to fight the wheel or the stick. But in this one, you trim the elevator, the rudder, uh, you trim it all together and everything moves. Mm -hmm. And then you just sit back and, and simply sit, fly. Sit, sit back and if you have a course correction, it only takes a slight move to this side, and this is like a hang glider because uh, it, it'll curve this way just by movement of your shoulders. I read, and there was a magazine article about you, and I read that uh, after you get it trimmed up with that simply pot fly, that you can just lean and fly the airplane just by leaning your waist. Yes, that's true. That's correct. That's true. In, in my air coupe, I can turn it with one finger. I put one finger out the window, and it will turn. But you've got me beat. You're better than that. Uh, I don't have to open you, the canopy. <laughs> you just kind of think about it, and, and you lean in that direction, and you, you can control the airplane just by leaning. Mm -hmm. um, there's an interesting story about the end number, or, or the model number, on this airplane when you sent it back to the factory to be rebuilt. Uh, would you tell our viewers about that? You, you got caught in the gust from a 747 or something. I got caught in the early days uh, when I didn't have a radio, uh, did not have a radio. It was a uh, DC-6 coming in for a landing. That's four engines, and four, each engine has four propellers. Four, four engines, propellers. and it has uh, wake turbulence, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, it caught me. And uh, I was, uh, I crashed it. And, uh, well, you only weigh 500 pounds. Yeah, I, I broke the wing off right about midway out on the wing mm -hmm. and smashed the engine and everything, and it, it took a major rebuild. And uh, it, uh, I sent the engine back, and I sent the, uh, the uh, after part of the fuselage, and I sent uh, most of the instruments, uh, which at that time were very few. And uh, Al Mooney built me a... Uh, uh, a brand new airplane, in essence, and uh, it still has a serial 51, but the uh, the number used to be 390A, Able, in those days, and uh, they changed it to 119er Charlie. Because those were the wings that were laying against the wall ready to use. Yeah, they, the, the wings at that time had the numbers on them. And rather than uh, repaint the wings, they just changed the number, which is a stroke so of the pen. So you got whatever wings happened to be next in line. Mm -hmm. It was the, the second, uh, second to the last of the Mooney 
uh, L models. And That's from like then on, engines. Yeah. From then on, they, uh, they built the Continentals and then the C models and then, uh, and then the LA models, which was the, uh, um, the Continentals were rated at 850 pounds. This one is at 780 pounds. So there's a weight increase. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, used the same airframe for the Lycomings from then on. And uh, 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 well, let's talk a little bit about, we talked about the airplane. Let's talk a little bit about Gary Graman. Um, your home state is Indiana. Yes. And uh, you were in the radar in World War II, yes. uh, radar man or electronics. Marine Corps. Marine Corps. And you served in uh, the Gilberts and the Marshall Islands. Yes, Marianas. And Marianas. And uh, then you came back and you used your GI Bill to get an education in electronics. Yes. And surprise, folks, this is the guy who started and put Channel 8 on the air here in San Diego. Now tell us about starting television station Channel 8. Well, I was, it was uh, May the 16th when we went on the air. And I had worked at the... And the year was what? 1949. 49. And the year that this was born. That was the same year that this airplane was made. Yes. And uh, I was at the transmitter and uh, they needed a man to, to operate the studio and uh, I was elected. And so I, uh, I ran the studio. For you were studio supervisor, is yes. that the title? Mm -hmm. Studio supervisor. I was uh, there for four years. Uh, studio supervisor is the guy who gets to tell Bob Dale what to do. No. <laughs> uh, then you went on and uh, later got involved with NASA and our space program. Would you tell our viewers about that? Well, you, in you founded your own company. 1957, I founded Dynair Electronics Incorporated. And uh, one of our, we, we broke into solid state electronics, that's transistors, et cetera, in uh, about 1962. And we built the, uh, the uh, switching equipment at uh, Lockheed Missiles in Space. They were using it to uh, catalog all the junk that was floating around in orbit. By that time, we had a lot of it. Yes, mm -hmm. and so they had to, uh, catalog it and catalog every piece so that was pretty good business and then we we did work with uh, Cape Canaveral and uh, Houston and uh, JPL and uh, that's uh, very the, impressive so the, you actually had a part in our space program yes yes uh, uh, everything that went through or every uh, every bit of information that you saw from the uh, unmanned space shots uh, went through our equipment. And uh, I think you recently sold your company and, yes, I and did. you're now retired. 1995 sold. Uh, you're a member of the Antiquers, the yes. Aircraft yes, Antique Aircraft Association. And you're probably busier now than you have been before because <laughs> you're always flying. Every time I come to the airport, you're flying. I'm flying and doing a lot of other things too. But, Is there anything uh, else you'd like to tell our viewers about uh, your career or about your airplane? Well, I guess not. There's so much he can't <laughs> fit it in. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for letting us visit with you today. Thank you, Fred. For As always, me. this is Captain Fred saying, I love airplanes and I honor the people who fly them. Happy birthday to the Mooney Mike.